So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your uh, presence. Welcome to this uh, seminar of uh, uh, ALDE. And first of all, thanks uh, uh, to uh, the uh, members of the parliament, Marianne Harkin and Dirk Sterks, who are uh, responsible uh, for uh, this uh, seminar uh, uh, today. Um, first of all, I, I, I think that a, a seminar on pension reform, make or break, is very timely. Uh, very timely. Why? Uh, because, uh, as you know, the European Parliament uh, will adopt next week uh, a, a report on, on, on pension, uh, responding to the European Commission's uh, Green Paper uh, of last uh, summer. Uh, and that means that we are in the middle of a process, because normally after greens come white, I think, uh, in, in Europe, is it, uh, as that, uh, a, a white paper. And uh, to prepare that white paper, uh, this uh, green paper is extremely uh, important. But there is not only um, uh, this uh, report, uh, a report that is the start of uh, the process, and, and, and I can tell you also that our group is broadly happy uh, with the content uh, of uh, the uh, report. Um, why? Because uh, uh, the, the report is also tackling the main question is how to make our pension system uh, sustainable and safe for the future. Uh, how also um, um, to provide for the needs of European citizens uh, uh, providing portability and usability. Um, and I think that this um, seminar is also uh, very timely uh, because, as you know, um, for the, it should be for the first time in, an, in, in a text on economic governance, uh, there is also uh, foreseen in a coordinated uh, pension uh, reform at uh, the union level because, as you know, in the paper of uh, Mrs. Merkel of last week, that was not discussed in the Council. That's the official version of the Council, but it exists, the text. Uh, we can procure you some, uh, some copies if you want. Uh, that's the only advantage to be in a coalition uh, government in Germany, at least. So uh, in this uh, paper uh, of Mrs. Merkel, for the first time, uh, there is also uh, the element that is mentioned that uh, we should uh, reform uh, pension systems uh, in uh, Europe uh, because of the demographic developments that we are facing now uh, for the moment, and that this uh, pension reforms should be an essential element uh, of the economic governance of the future. So it's not only uh, the, uh, the green uh, uh, paper uh, followed by the white paper uh, that uh, was the reason for organizing the seminar, but also the fact that uh, on the highest level in the European Union, uh, in the European Council, and uh, in a number of uh, uh, contributions to this European Council, pension uh, reform is, at, uh, is in the heart of the debate. Uh, and uh, I, I think that for that reason alone, it, it is absolutely necessary uh, that in this European Parliament, and more especially uh, in ALDE, we are reflecting uh, on uh, this. So there are a number of questions that uh, our imminent panel will address uh, today. Uh, I shall not present you the panel, that's the work of Marianne Harkin, but uh, I, I want to conclude by thanking in any way all those who are participating, and especially Laszlo Andor, the Commissioner, uh, for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, uh, who is responsible for this uh, portfolio uh, in uh, the European Commission. Thank you very much. It's uh, very well appreciated, uh, Mr. Commissioner, that uh, you are participating to our, uh, to our meeting and to our seminar. Maria. Thank you, Guy, and good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to what we all hope will be a very interesting and informative seminar. As Guy has said, this is an ongoing process. 
started with the green paper from the Commission and then there was a consultation process of all the stakeholders. The Parliament is playing its role in that with its report, which will be voted on in Strasbourg next week. And uh, as Guy has said, it's been discussed at the European Council. So I think it's very timely that this morning we can hear what the European Commission has to say. So first of all, I would like to introduce our first speaker this morning, Commissioner Laszlo Ander. As I said, it will be very interesting to see the thoughts of the Commission at this, at this point. Commissioner. Thank you very much, uh, honourable members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is for me a great pleasure uh, to speak today in this ALDE conference on pension reform. I believe uh, we're all sitting here today because we have a common concern. How do we make sure that European pension systems are fit for purpose, given the challenges that Europe will face over the coming decade? This is an issue which will affect all Europeans from across uh, the whole Europe. As you know, last July, uh, the European Commission launched the Green Paper on Pensions to kickstart the debate on what kind of adjustment the national pension systems are needed and what kind of support is needed at uh, EU level. This conference is an important part of the debate to sound out new ideas and identify potential problems. And I would like to thank the organizers for the initiative in keeping up the pressure to find the right solutions to this pressing problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe uh, we face uh, four key challenges in relation to the future of uh, our pension systems. First, we need to overcome the imbalances resulting from the increasing divergence between life expectancy and retirement ages. Since 2000, member states have managed to raise employment rates of older workers and exit ages from the labour market. However, we still have a long way to go before we achieve the right balance. Moreover, we need to factor in longer periods in retirement as people live longer. Second, we need to adjust the European framework to reflect the changes that have come about in national pension systems after a decade of pension reforms. We move from largely single systems to multi-pillar systems in many member states, and this means that there is a much larger role for pre-funded, defined benefit private pension schemes in future pension provision. This means that internal market and cross-border issues will become increasingly important. As such, EU rules will need to be updated. Third, we must draw lessons from the financial and economic crisis. The crisis has highlighted the need to review financial market exposure and the design of our pension systems in order to improve risk mitigation and enhance the funded pension's capacity for shock absorption. Here I see a role for the EU in terms of improving economic governance and promoting exchange of good practices. Furthermore, high levels of unemployment and the serious deterioration of public finances have weakened the basis for pay as you go public pensions, that's clear. We urgently need to undertake pension reforms to ensure future long-term sustainability and adequacy at the same time. Fourth, we need to fully prepare our pension systems for the acceleration of population aging. This is no longer a distant scenario. From 2012, the working age population in Europe will begin to shrink as the baby boomers reach the retirement age, coupled with low fertility levels in many member states. Ladies and gentlemen, the member states have already engaged in long-standing cooperation to learn from each other's experience and exchange good practice in pension reforms. There is a consensus on the need for coordination at EU level and for establishing EU rules on cross-border issues. For the last 10 years, coordination at EU level has underpinned, many, uh, underpinned the member states' efforts to modernize their pension systems and many member states have already made good progress in adapting the pension systems to reflect <coughs> demographic aging, changes in the labor market, and evolving gender roles. However, most member states have a long way to go, 
and few others have not even begun with pension reforms. We should recognize that ongoing reforms carry new risks. Indeed, as reforms make future pensions far more dependent on long-term developments in labor markets and financial markets. This means that we need to create employment opportunities and increase the stability of financial systems. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad uh, Mr. President highlighted the importance of the Green Paper, and I would like to uh, remind ourselves that this document uh, looked at three areas primarily. First, the Green Paper examined uh, broad strategic issues, including links to the Europe 2020 strategy. Second, it looks at removing obstacles to mobility for workers and also financial services. And third, it raises the issue of achieving safer pensions. The Green Paper resulted in more than 100 meetings and conferences with stakeholders, and we received almost 1,700 responses. The consultation has encouraged and informed debates at national level, including by comparing developments that have taken place across the EU. It has also brought to light on issues uh, which were previously seen as taboo, such as changes to retirement ages or closing of early exit routes. Recently, uh, Spain, I should say even Spain, has reached political agreement on increasing the retirement age to 67. In Denmark, there have been proposals to abolish early retirement provisions. And in the Netherlands, there have been discussions about increasing pensionable ages. The Green Paper has been broadly welcomed, in particular its holistic approach, and we certainly succeeded in our aim of starting an EU debate about pensions. Pension reforms in uh, Europe now has a higher profile than it has uh, had for many years. We now need to build on this achievement, and this is where we will need the involvement of all actors at all levels. The Commission is currently in uh, the final stages of analyzing the results of the four months consultation. We have just received responses from the Committee of the Regions and the European Economic and Social Committee, and we are waiting for the European Parliament to adopt its final opinion. As such, it is still too early to draw any uh, final conclusions. However, it is clear that we need a set of clear messages from the Parliament, and I am very grateful to the ALDE Group for its contributions to the EP report, which I hope can draw support from all sides of the political spectrum. In the meantime, the Commission will be working on a white paper, indeed, to draw policy conclusions from the consultation. This is scheduled uh, in the work program of the Commission for the third quarter of this year. Ladies and gentlemen, developments in member states, such as Greece, for example, against the backdrop of severe austerity measures have shown that urgent action is needed. I know this has been difficult, sometimes very tense, but it is clear that we need to take decisive steps to safeguard the future of pension systems. The annual growth survey, uh, which was adopted by the Commission last month, has already outlined three areas for improvement. First, we suggest that pensionable ages should be linked to longer life expectancy. Second, we need to improve employment opportunities for all the workers and prevent early exits from the labor market. And thirdly, we stress the importance of complementary private savings to improve income uh, during retirement. We also underlined the need to review the directive on the activities and supervision of institutions for occupational retirement provision, the IORP directive. Given the urgency of the situation, the Commission has already started the preparations for the white paper. Yesterday, I met the Commissioner's group on pensions to, discu uh, to discuss uh, the responses uh, on the green paper as well as uh, possible policy options on how to update and improve the European framework on pensions. 
there was agreement that we should continue with the holistic approach to pension reforms, simultaneously tackling issues of adequacy, sustainability, and safety. As part of this, we need to continue a dialogue with the key stakeholders, both on possible new regulatory initiatives in such fields as portability of occupational pension schemes and insolvency protection, and other softer forms of regulation, such as codes of good practice. Ladies and gentlemen, the last 12 months have seen a lively debate in the field of pension reforms, uh, but this year promises to be equally intense. I count on your support to bring about real change to create both adequate and sustainable pensions for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And you're right when you say you have opened up the debate. You have put pensions on the agenda from the 1,700 people who responded to your consultation right up to the European Council. Now, the Commissioner has kindly agreed to remain with us until about uh, 9.40 this morning, so we have a short opportunity for some questions to the Commissioner, and he has indicated that he will be delighted to engage with the audience. So if anybody has a question, you might first of all give me your name and if you represent a particular organisation, and if you have a question for the Commissioner, I'll put it to him now. Yep. <laughs> Everybody's very pleased with the commission. Yes, we have a questioner down in the, the back row there. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. My name is Van Meerten from uh, Holland Financial Centre, the Netherlands. Um, I was wondering if the commission is um, planning some action, well, undoubtedly they are, about the situation in Middle and Eastern Europe with regard to the pension reform on the second pillar changes that are made, uh, well, especially in Hungary. Is that on the agenda or is that too controversial? Uh, the point is that through the discussion, we received a lot of confirmation to the subsidiarity principle, uh, also from the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's very clear that uh, in Europe, uh, fundamentally, the design, the funding, the reforms of the pension systems is the competence and the responsibility of the member states. The EU has been playing a role, and I think this role has been very much welcomed, uh, to analyse the challenges, to develop possible options and, uh, and uh, exchange the good uh, practices and maintain this dialogue for the benefit of all. Uh, but uh, there is a certain limit of the competencies. There is the right to initiative uh, on, uh, uh, on issues where uh, the questions derive from an integrated European labour market or integrated European financial uh, market. And that's where the Commission will take the initiative. Now, on the cases of uh, the Central European uh, countries and the Balkans, where there is a specific uh, question concerning the <coughs> mandatory funded uh, pillars, uh, which um, is a structure that emerged uh, after the 1990s uh, in a more or less uh, uh, similar and simultaneous uh, way. Um, these countries implemented reforms, and uh, this is perhaps a time when uh, they can look back and, uh, and analyze to, f to what extent these reforms fulfilled the original expectations and to what extent the pension systems that they have uh, turned out to be resilient or vulnerable at the time of uh, the financial crisis. Uh, there's practically no country in this group that uh, would have refrained completely from some kind of adjustment of uh, the rules because of the crisis, because the crisis was really you know, a very stressful experience for public finances, and there was a need and also a room for some flexibility. Uh, the question is, uh, what should we say uh, if the changes 
dramatic like the case of uh, the Hungarian experience. Um, the point is that, of course, uh, it's unlikely that uh, this uh, example would be among the positive references in the white paper when we try to uh, disseminate the best practices, uh, not simply because of uh, the end result, because the end result, what kind of uh, structure or what kind of design emerges, how many pillars, is the competence of the member states. But we may have an opinion about the way of reforming, whether a government involves or doesn't involve uh, the most important stakeholders in the preparation. If, uh, if the stakeholders are not involved, if uh, adequate uh, calculations are not made, if uh, a long-term impact assessment is not created, uh, neither the Commission nor the stakeholders nor the citizens of the country can make sure uh, that the long-term adequacy of the pensions and the long-term sustainability of the pension system is uh, guaranteed. And these are the key weaknesses of uh, this uh, case. Uh, the Commission has uh, been in touch uh, to the extent on certain issues and especially how the pension uh, reforms uh, impact on uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, which is fundamentally the macroeconomic uh, dimension of uh, this question. So on this uh, issue, the Commission, there was a contact, of course, there was a discussion. Uh, nine member states wrote a letter last summer to the Commission uh, in order to request uh, uh, an appropriate interpretation uh, of, of these uh, pension reforms in order to avoid that the fiscal consequences of the pension reform uh, would weaken uh, these countries in the context of uh, the Stability and Growth Pact. You probably know the results of uh, this uh, debate. It uh, concluded sometime at the end of last September. Uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there are no open questions left, because if there is such a fundamental reversal of a reform, like in the case of Hungary, it remains uh, an open question uh, in what way uh, the, reversal, the return of the funds uh, can, be, uh, can be accounted for. And that's where... Uh, some questions remain open, but this is for all Iran uh, to judge uh, according to uh, European standards. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Yes, I'll take two questions, perhaps. I'll take this gentleman first. Yes? Yes. Yeah, my name is I'm Micro, please. I am representing the German Insurance Association. I've got a question on the future of the open method of coordination. I think uh, the benefits of this open method of coordination is to, sharing, to share best practices and also to compile data on pensions in Europe. However, um, if you have a look at figures which are in the annex of the Green Paper on Pensions, um, the character is very aggregate so far, uh, meaning it's not clear which characteristics of pensions are included. Um, for example, whether or not they provide survivors' benefits, whether or not they provide um, disability benefits, what are the capital market risks, etc. So my question would be, what are your plans for the further development of the open method of coordination with regard to the characteristics of, of pensions. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I'll take a second question, Commissioner, if that's okay. This lady here. Yes, my name is Rena Christopher. I'm a journalist. I wanted to ask what role uh, private pension provision, um, if you could discuss that in a bit more detail, uh, Commissioner, and if you think that there may be a need for tax incentives. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Well, uh, I also believe that the open method of coordination has been uh, very useful uh, also in this area, and we would like to build on that. That also means in this context, uh, particularly the continued work in the Economic Policy Committee and the Social Protection Committee, and that's uh, where uh, a more detailed, more nuanced uh, uh, analysis uh, can uh, continue, and also in uh, the Commission in uh, the DG employment uh, uh, in particular. Um, the, the Green Paper did not uh, provide an excessive amount of detailed information because it was meant to be uh, very concentrated and um, in a way very educational and also understandable for the general public. And that's why it was more an inclination to, to provide uh, uh, aggregate uh, data and uh, easily understandable uh, statistics. But we believe it is supported by a more detailed uh, analysis and it will continue uh, as, uh, as a major uh, analytical uh, contribution from, uh, from uh, the Commission. On issues like that, disability, which you mentioned, uh, it was you know, deliberate that we mentioned disability as an important point just also to indicate that uh, we're not forgetting about this very important uh, dimension, but, uh, but uh, also because of this holistic approach uh, on such uh, questions, there was simply no room to go into very much uh, detail. So there are various groups which uh, may not find themselves in the text of uh, the Green Paper, like, for example, to give you another example, the widows. We discuss whether we should kind of discuss this because in some country groups it's a relevant question how to deal with the widow's pensions. But we went for the more general themes um, that uh, that have been now in the focus of the discussion. I think it also uh, resulted in a sufficient uh, body of um, opinions and and analysis. Uh, uh, but it doesn't mean that we would refrain from dealing with the further details and there would be no need for that. Uh, what role for the private uh, uh, pensions? Uh, the Green Paper identifies the increasing trend and uh, does not speak about uh, incentives, although in my view the uh, annual growth survey made a step forward in this area and highlighted uh, the importance, the benefit of, uh, of uh, 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 voluntary uh, supplementary uh, savings in this area. But uh, it's unlikely that it would go into uh, details like tax in incentives. Uh, I mean, I would like to leave this open, but uh, first of all, because going into taxation questions on the EU level is uh, uh, quite a sensitive one, although Commissioner Shemeta is also part of uh, our group of commissioners who uh, deal with the uh, pensions. And also because uh, I already stressed the principle of uh, neutrality of the Commission in terms of not being biased for this or that uh, model, uh, the point we wanted to make and want to make again is uh, that uh, adequacy, sustainability, and safety has to be ensured at the same time. They have to be pursued with the same effort and coordinated. And we believe that uh, various models can be capable under adequate regulation uh, of uh, delivering all uh, these objectives. Thank you, Commissioner. I think if there was one more question, perhaps I could take it. Yes, this gentleman here. Under when you said um, one of the three lessons learned from the comments on the Green Paper was to encourage complementary private savings. I would be interested, um, does it say that you would look then more for the third pillar than to the second pillar? Because we do believe um, that if the first pillar systems have to be, um, let's say, the level will be hold or cut, uh, then you can deliver such benefits which also should include risks only in collective systems and the Green Book asked is there a need for uh, accompanying 28 system new system 
was that comment directed to this? Could you just comment on the on the thinking between the 28th uh, system and where do you focus more on the second pillar or the third pillar systems? Thank you. Yes, another question highlighted the dilemmas with the second pillar. Uh, I think, uh, in a way, this is premature uh, to answer. I, I should still wait uh, for conclusions, if any uh, comes out uh, of, of uh, the Green Paper <coughs> consultation uh, itself. Uh, if it does, I will certainly uh, uh, come back, and, uh, and I'm sure we will have later opportunities uh, to, to discuss pensions uh, again. Uh, but uh, just as in the previous uh, case of the previous question, I believe uh, the, uh, the objectives uh, we have should be maintained. The focus uh, of, of our efforts should uh, remain on the, the, the key challenges identified in the Green Paper. And whether it comes to uh, a greater emphasis on the second or the third pillar, I think, but it's just a, a kind of prediction, it will remain secondary. So it's not, it's not going to be the main uh, uh, task, either, uh, nor for the white paper, to, to tell. Uh, but there are many months of work ahead uh, to, to answer this. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I think we will let you go at this stage. We just want to say we are very appreciative of your time and your expertise, Commissioner. And thank you once again. Now, we will start with the first panel, which will look at the issue of adequacy and sustainability of European pension systems. We have three experts with us here this morning, and we will start with the, the first speaker, who is Mr. Hans Martens, Chief Executive of the European Policy Centre. Mr. Martens. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I just want to say before I start that I am not the greatest uh, pension expert in the world, and I think we have a lot of them, and you will hear a lot about the finer details today. I'm going to focus on the sustainability issue uh, to discuss a bit the macroeconomic context that we are in. But I do have the benefit of talking about pensions as something which is real near for me, um, <laughs> if I can put it that way. I'm not uh, here by saying at what time I will go on pension, but it is not something which is in a very distant future. So it is a relevant and very serious question. But let's first look at our public finances. Um, now, uh, I just wanted to remind us all that the picture is not uh, particularly uh, nice, as we all know. Uh, and the only way to get it worse is to look at the next slide to actually include the Irish situation, which is then distorting the picture quite enormously and make all the others look like more or less in balance, but we have to remember they are not. But there's also a, a brighter future looking ahead for us uh, because according to OECD, uh, at least the, the, the iris will begin to normalize um, uh, in 2012, but there is always, of course, a tendency to, to look a bit more bright for the future. Uh, but if we just look at the next slide, just to make it clear, I put in the line for the Growth and Stability Pact, and I think it's, it's pretty clear for everybody that uh, apart from, from uh, Germany, uh, nobody is uh, even near within the uh, limits of the 3% of the GDP in 2011. And uh, if we come to the next one, which shows us the, the debt, the government debt, you can see that we are clearly outside of the framework for the uh, Growth and Stability Pact. And this is, of course, something uh, that has focused the policymakers on rebalancing the public budgets, and as soon as they were trying to forget it, the markets were reminding, of course, that uh, there was a job to be, to be done. By the way, I added in here Japan and the US, uh, also just to remind everybody that it is not just in Europe that we have these uh, problems. 
I just want to show one more slide because this is about servicing the debt because in the, in the discussion we had about the debt crisis or deficit crisis or whatever it was that Confused Market talked about, um, there was always a discussion about will it be possible for the European countries to service their debt. And I was a bit surprised over that discussion, which came from uh, people with much more Nobel Prizes than I could ever uh, dream of. Uh, but if you look a little bit back on the figures, you'll see that, well, of course, there's a dramatic jump this year for Ireland. But apart from that, the burden in relation to GDP of servicing the debt uh, was much, much bigger before the euro came. So, I mean, Greece, Portugal, other countries, even at the present rate of, of financing their debt, is actually getting away a lot cheaper uh, than they were uh, before the euro or back in the 90s, as you can see. And I think that's worth noticing because... Obviously, servicing the debt means that you have to collect taxes for purposes which you can't pay back to the population in the form of pensions or education or whatever it is. And um, it, the only thing I want to say as a warning here is that we are, of course, now very dependent on keeping the relatively low interest rate level that we have because there is a vulnerability, as you can guess, uh, to, to, uh, to the interest rate, and I'm pretty certain that our friends over in the, in the European Central Bank are looking at that particular problem also uh, besides the inflation issue when they uh, look at the interest rates. But, you know, all of this has been about the Growth and Stability Pact, and I was asked to, to mention this here today, uh, but there has been an enormous focus on fiscal policy. And now Mr. Verhofstadt was mentioning uh, the Merkel paper that doesn't exist, but of which I have a copy. Um, and if you look at the six points in there, which includes the pension reform, it is my very clear opinion that this is not about what it should be. This is still about redressing or addressing the fiscal issues, not really addressing what is needed in Europe, the structural reform. I see very little reference to smart, green, and inclusive growth in that paper and in those ideas. And I want to uh, point to you that in order to deal with the things, and if you could show the next one, um, this is really about uh, recreating a growth potential in Europe. I mean, policymakers has partly because of the hysteria at the market has been forced to look at the, and I said partly because there is, of course, some reality to it, but there's been a lot of focus on uh, balancing the public budgets and on cutting the public sector and what do I know. But there is also an enormous need for modernization in Europe, and that is the need and the reason I want to mention again the Europe 2020, which seems to be completely off the agenda and completely forgotten, I mean, it doesn't help to refer to the fact that the Lisbon strategy was not a big success and all that kind of stuff, because this slide shows you uh, the competitiveness potential, or therefore the growth potential, as estimated by the World Economic Forum. It's their index. And you might not be able to see it, but of course the low-growth countries here are the ones that exactly have the biggest problems and therefore needs to grow to grow more. So Spain, Portugal, Italy, Hungary, and Greece, amongst my examples here, I at the bottom, and it is my clear conviction that the reason that these countries have the worst public uh, finances is because of lack of modernization, because of lack of structural reform, not the other way around. So I'm making a strong plea here, and I'll do that again in a moment, on the need for modernization of Europe, also because we are in a very tough uh, international competition. So um, I just wanted to, to repeat for you that it is very, very important that we go back to economic growth. And I'm not here because I'm just an ultra-liberal, you know, growth fanatic. I'm just saying that if we don't grow, we will run into huge problems because we have a, a, a fiscal balance issue now, and we'll get one that is much bigger in a moment. We also know that in order to, re, to return to full employment, the way into it, if we want to do that by growth, we need at least 2% annual economic growth to really address the unemployment issues. Um, so um, I would like just to show the next slide just to irritate a number of people, and I was hoping that Mr. Farbstadt would stay here because uh, I've been trying to make a very rude line to Europe uh, because we normally have the, the liberal economies north of the line, and the reason I wanted for Hofstad to be here, but I can then tease all the other Belgiums here, is that it goes right to Belgium. So it actually separates <laughs> Wallonia from Flanders, and that normally uh, raises quite a lot of, of debate. But in any case, uh, we might say we have the more conservative and, uh, and more change-resisting um, countries south. Of course, this is not uh, completely and entirely right, but actually I think when it comes to pension, it is completely wrong, and I'll come back to that in a little moment. 
But I wanted to talk to you about the, the threat of demographics. And uh, if you can see the next slide, just the next one again. Uh, this um, is not because it really matters what we're saying here, but I just wondered if people have really been studying these figures from the commission and if everybody is actually aware of the fact that by 2060, providing we don't have any enlargement, uh, Germany will go from being the biggest country in the EU to the third largest. And actually the UK will be the largest one in that time. Whether that is good or bad, I will uh, leave to uh, yourself to conclude on, and France will be number two, and I could make the same comment there. But there are countries that are going to be very strongly affected with this. If you take a country like Bulgaria, its population will go down from nearly eight million to about five million. So we're talking about a huge dissemination here um, of it. Um, I think the Germans can also look forward to a lot of funerals here. I mean. 52 million deaths until 2060 seems to be a thriving business. But anyway, uh, next uh, slide, because this is actually about the working population. And here is something good for the Irish and not for anybody else, because the Irish actually will have a growth in the, uh, in the working population. Uh, but if there's a smile on the face of the Irish, I'll take it off in a minute. But I just wanted to enjoy the, let you enjoy the, the picture for a second, because you can see that the workforce is being reduced substantially in more or less all other countries. And then, mind you, when you see these statistics, be aware that there's a big mistake here, because statistically we count the workforce as between 15 and 64. I do not believe that on the way to 2060, with the demand for more knowledge-based growth, that we will let people out on the labor market when they're 15. So actually, we should be talking about 25 to 64. And then somebody might say, well, OK, we do pension reform, so we're talking about 25 to 74. My guess is that it will be easier to keep people under education 10 years more than it will be to increase the pension age. So just be aware that we might be cheating ourselves. Let's take the smile of the Irish now, uh, because if we look at the, uh, the retirement population, you'll see that uh, the, uh, the bad news here is, of course, that for everybody, uh, we have a very high growth in the number of people over 65, and that is particularly true in, in Ireland. And uh, the final one on the demographics, not the final, the near, nearly final, is just to show you that uh, we'll nearly treble the population over 80 years, uh, over the next um, 40 to 50 years. But that gives something that is quite uh, serious, and that's the next slide, which is our dependency rates. And for those of you not familiar with the terminology, this is quite simply the relationship between what we call the working population, let me put it this way, between the people who are between 15 and 64, and the people who are below 15 or over 65, okay? So if you have a relationship of about, uh, as it is in, or will be in the EU in average, of around 80, it actually means that one person working will have to support 0.8 person, either under 15 or over 65. And I think there will be economists criticizing my conclusion, but I think I can basically say that means that we will have to pay would 80% in taxes without any deductions. And I'm wondering whether this is a sustainable development or not. I mean, I am Danish of birth, and they seem to have a very strong uh, preference to paying whatever they can in taxes, and the more the better. But I think probably uh, when we reach uh, a level around 80% but people will begin to to wonder if this is a good idea. And actually, there are problems in this, because first of all, we have probably overestimated the workforce here. Secondly, I'm afraid that the figures that we have on migration here are also a bit overvalued with the political debate we have uh, around migration, because of course, migration goes into the forecast here. So I mean, we are heading, in my opinion, for a completely unsustainable situation for the European welfare states. And now, uh, you could say, well, uh, I'm quite happy, you know, for the increase in living age, you know, being in my age here. But it, the, the problem is that we at the same time have, as the Commissioner said, an enormous growth in the aging of the population, a more rapid increase than I think the world has ever seen. And at the same time, a very low fertility. Had we at the same time had high fertility as we have the aging population, the problem would, of course, be smaller. 
But I am afraid that it might be possible that we enter into this demographic situation with unemployment, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of focus on how can we get more out on the labor market? How can we, by increasing pension age, make people work longer? How can we integrate immigrants and therefore get a bigger working population, etc., etc.? This is very good, but only if there's jobs for them, because even if the workforce is decreasing, we start with an average of 10% unemployment, right? And if we don't have a substantial economic uh, growth in the meantime, we might actually at least get some structural unemployment when we reach 2060. And that will then add to the, to the problems of the dependency rates, so that will actually re raise the, the relationship between those in work and therefore paying and contributing for the welfare state and those out. This is leading me to one particular point that I think is very, very important and not well understood, and I'm sure there will be people here disagreeing with me. But it has been very easy for Europeans to support and guard the welfare state as long as it was growing. So at the time where you were demanding shorter pension age or earlier retirement age, or more child benefits, or more money for education. As long as all others could get more at the same time, it was easy to do that process. What I'm trying to tell you here is that we will go into a situation, in my opinion, where the public welfare pot will not grow. So if you demand more for the pension side, you will have to ask yourself who's then going to pay for it. Is it education that will suffer? Is it unemployment benefits, or is it whatever? Because there will not be money to increase for everybody uh, in the future. In the, uh, I think we, it's more likely, or well, it is likely, that we're going to see a smaller pot of money to share. And there is a particular issue which I could spend two hours on, but I won't do it. But there is a question of uh, the delivery services of our public sectors as well. And it is a particular big problem because we can't measure it. The only way today uh, at European and national level you can, you can measure the value of the public sector is to its input. So in other words, its cost rather than its production. So it's difficult to establish best practices and benchmarks and so on and so forth. But if we then look uh, into the possible issues of pension reform, we look at the next one here. Um, I just want to say on the early retirement schemes, My honest opinion is that they have to go. I'm not talking about the health space. I'm not talking about people who are uh, disabled or not able to work and so on. I'm talking about perfectly healthy 60 or 62 year olds, the people I used, to, I will call the young people, right? Uh, who are going around uh, on public pensions, playing golf and uh, taking nice trips to uh, Caribbean or working hard for their children, you know, as laborers in their houses that they have bought too expensive and therefore needs the granddad to work for them. So I, I'm basically saying I think this have to go. I'm very much in support of Mr. Anders' point on the uh, revision of the normal pension age by linking, indexing it to living age. And I think it's a fair deal. Every three years you count what has the, how much has the, uh, the, the living age gone up and then you index the pension age. I think it's a fair deal, and it shouldn't really be a thing about a political discussion, because that's just the way it is. But do remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are two issues here. One, if you want to avoid a too drastic aging of our workforce, you have to think a little bit in terms of second careers here, because they really want people at 78 still to be managing the companies, you know, and get the higher and higher salaries and all that. So that, that is one issue that we can discuss. Uh, the other uh, issue is that if we increase the pension age, we also need to make certain that we have jobs for those people. Because to me, it is not a big reform to take somebody and put them uh, on employment, unemployment benefits instead of on pension. I mean, so if the alternative is unemployment benefits, then we're not going well. And that brings me back to the, the point about growth I mentioned before. There has been some discussion already this morning about the tax-funded or insurance-based. Uh, I don't think the discussion is particularly important, so in the different pillars and so on, because in the end, we either give subsidies from the state or we support the schemes, so the government budgets come into it as well. And then just one point about the, uh, the funded uh, schemes. Uh, don't forget when you get excited about them that uh, the funded schemes 
also need to give a return to be able to pay your pensioners. And that actually means that if our economy is not particularly growing and we invest the money in Europe, then the return on the investment will not be big enough to, to cater for the pensions. And then you could say, well, then we allow the pension schemes in Europe to go in the growth areas of the world, so to the BRIC countries and elsewhere. Yeah, okay, fine, good. Uh, but then you also have to, uh, to, to look at the, 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 the risks here. For example, the currency risk, because who can tell me uh, where the Chinese currency uh, is in relation to our currency in a couple of years from now? So there's, uh, of course, a bigger risk the further out we, we go. But I just want to say that just bringing in the funded schemes doesn't solve all the problems. And now let me come back to my map from before about the pension reform, because I have uh, two pictures here. One, no. Oh, one south of the line, that was France, and one uh, north of the line, which was in Denmark. Because the minute the early, the scrapping the early retirement schemes, I'm not talking about even going into a pension reform, but scrapping pre-retirement schemes, uh, or at least modifying them in Denmark, as soon as that happened, hell broke loose. Uh, I wouldn't say that we could, uh, in the small country they could mobilize 3 million people every Sunday, you know, for a successive row of Sundays because there's only 6 million people uh, to take from. But I think the, the, the political negative reaction to it was the same. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, pension reform is easy to talk about as an expert. It's easy to talk about here and to discuss, but it is politically dynamite. It is really dangerous to deal with. My final, next to final slide is uh, this one. I just want to remind you about our pension systems. Because when pensions were introduced in the uh, early uh, industrial society about 100 years ago, uh, this was more or less what we were giving people. So, um, you know, retirement at 65, fine, because people live in average until they're about 70. So we can always give them five years at the end of their life. So thank you very much. And we didn't have so long education at the time. So we were actually working 71.5% of our life at that time. But now I'm saying we actually don't start working until we're about 25 in average. We go on pension when we're 65 and live to 85, which then means that we're working only 48% of the time these days. I know that things have changed over the 100 years, but I just think that we need to remember that the pension schemes were never designed to last for 20 or 25 years. People were not, we were not expecting people to live that long after pension. Finally, just to bring up the conclusions here, um, the pension problem is very visible in this whole context here because of the, the aging of the population, but the real problem is nowadays to finance the European welfare state with all the kind of things it does on free health, free education, unemployment benefits, pension schemes, child support, all of that, and whether Europeans are mature enough to actually make the choices and if they also can show enough solidarity to actually think of the other receivers of the welfare benefits. And I'm just warning here because my firm conviction is that if we do not take these reform issues seriously and if we do not make certain that there will be money to finance the kind of things, it will, the result will be more inequality in Europe because it will start like we've seen in Britain you pay for your education, you will pay for your health, you will pay for this, you will pay for that, you will have supplementary pension systems and so on and so forth. Who will be the winners? Those with the money. Who will be the losers? Those without. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martins, and you certainly set the scene for us, uh, the need for structural reform right now, the need to look to Europe 2020 and growth, and then, of course, you brought us all back to reality with the statement that in 2060, according to you, the future of the European welfare state is completely unsustainable. So you're certainly it's making us... today. You're making us face the hard questions, and I'm really pleased about that because I think we want our discussion to be meaty and real, so I do think you've set the ball rolling. I'm now very pleased to introduce the second speaker this morning, Mr. D uh, Dick Slimers, who is CEO of APG. Mr. Slimers. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, if I, if I understand this, uh, Mr. Martins, well, the, the public finances in Europe are poor, the dependency ratios are up and will grow very clearly. So, in fact, there is no public money for Caribbean holidays and playing golf. And I would say that's a very disappointing message for all of us, for all of us liberals. And uh, I think that it clearly lines out the challenge that lies before the pension funds to try to fill that, uh, uh, that gap. 
quick. And be quick. <laughs> um, APG, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first say that is not a pension fund. We are an, uh, an all-round service provider for pension funds. We carry out the administration and asset management for some 30 uh, pension funds in the uh, in the Netherlands, and we uh, we manage some 280 billion uh, euros in assets for those uh, for those pension funds. If I may have the next slide. Now, in the Netherlands, we, we, we tend to believe that uh, we have the best soccer team in the world, which during the finals of the World Cup proved to be wrong. But we also tend to believe that we have the best pension fund in the uh, pension fund system in the world. And sometimes, uh, even organizations of non-Dutch origin uh, will sustain that opinion. And, uh, and sometimes even too. And this slides prove that the University of Melbourne and uh, a company called Mercer, that's very famous in the, in, the, in the pension sector, had a survey and out of that survey came the result that uh, the Netherlands at the end has the most adequate and sustainable pension system in the world. Uh, we are a little bit better than Switzerland and even than Sweden. Um, what you see here is only a very few European uh, uh, countries. Most of them are Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, and that has everything to do with the fact that those countries have rather a well-funded second pillar system. If I may have the next slide. Because uh, that is, ladies and gentlemen, the basis of the fact that uh, the Dutch system is seen not only by its own inhabitants as a very good pension system, but also around the world. And it has everything to do that if you look to the combination of the three pillar system in the Netherlands, you see a very sound, not only a first pillar, but also a very sound second pillar. The total amount of funded uh, pension euros in the Netherlands is over 700 and 50 billion euros. That is somewhere around one and a half time GDP of, uh, of the Netherlands. And um, well, that's of course, that, uh, that gives some, at least the Dutch, some belief that at the end of our, uh, our working life, yes, there is a view on a Caribbean holiday, and yes, maybe at least the Dutch will have some room to maneuver on the golf course. Um, what does really make the strength of the Dutch occupational pension? Maybe I, the next slide? Yes. Um, the good thing is that we have a very high uh, coverage through collective bargaining by uh, employers and employee organizations. It is part of the collective labor agreements in the Netherlands, and it, uh, the second pillar is highly compulsory. Um, we have, because it are collective pension uh, uh, schemes, low administration and investment cost. Uh, not so long ago, there was a survey of, uh, of the Dutch Central Bank, and that showed that if you look to the cost of individual pension schemes, then on that basis you pay, of the premium, you pay 25% of every euro you pay is at the end registered as cost. So a quarter of your pension you lose on cost. Now with collective pension schemes you pay only four, and if you would do it with APG, you pay only 2%. That is a quarter of your pension that you save if you operate on a collective pension scheme. Also, it is possible for big pension investors to operate on a very professional and also on a responsible investment side. I mean, we very much tend to subscribe idea as uh, ASG. Uh, that means that we invest on the basis of uh, environmental, social policy, and government principles. So we very much look towards companies that uh, have a good record on the environment, have a good record on uh, social policy, and have also good governance. And of course, very important within a collective system, it is the intergenerational risk sharing and solidarity. If you may have the next slide. Now, 
Of course, there are also, and I think after the speech of Mr. Martens, uh, there are clearly uh, challenges also facing the Dutch pension system. Also in the Netherlands, we see a rapid rise in life expectancy at 65. Here you see figures that were presented by the Dutch uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics. Um, and it shows that within a period of six years, the, the new forecast uh, inclined that um, the, the life expectancy uh, of men is increasing by nearly two years. And yes, ladies, uh, 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 for you, with nearly three years. Now, and this is not going to stop. Uh, not so long ago, I was at a seminar of a, uh, a group called uh, Future World, and uh, a, a very rather famous professor told me uh, that the person, man, but I expect it will be a, a woman, that will reach the age of 150 is already born. And you understand, if you are going to reach 150, that a debate about an, uh, a, a retirement age of 65 is, uh, uh, well, rather oblivious. And, and I must say that that, that was, uh, well, quite challenging. And next to me sat a young student, and he raised his hand, and he said, Sir, now you're talking about the future. May I ask you something about the past? And the professor said, of course. And he said, well, you know, in 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, I would wonder what would have happened with world policy if not John F. Kennedy would have been assassinated in 1963 with Nikita Khrushchev. Could you a little bit elaborate on that? Now, of course, the professor was a little bit dazzled, and he said, to be very honest, I have no idea. I have no idea. But but I know one thing for sure. I know one thing for sure. I'm absolutely sure. If in 1963, Nikita Khrushchev would have been assassinated, that Aristoteles Onassid would not have married the widow of Nikita Khrushchev. <laughs> now, <laughs> so some things in, in time of expectancy we know sure, and something we do not know. Now, the next... The next challenge, and this is going to be a very important challenge because it shows that pensions, and, and certainly in the Netherlands people have the impression that their pension is very secured, and they all believe that they will end up at the Caribbean island, uh, that, that will depend more and more not only to the contribution, the pension contribution, but more and more at the returns of pension investments. And that is the right side of the slide. And I don't have to uh, explain to you that with the very volatile uh, financial markets at the moment, that means that even in a, in a very secured, fully funded pension system, the outcome for pensioners is going to be much, much less secure than they thought so far. So maybe they end up on a Caribbean island, but maybe they will end up somewhere else. In the Netherlands, there is a, a quite a debate among social partners. That is the, 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 the word we use in the Netherlands for organizations of employers and organizations of employees. And it was um, decided that we should at least increase the retirement age in the first and the second pillar. And it is now foreseen in the coalition agreement you know, in the Netherlands, we have always a coalition government. In the coalition agreement that uh, we would increase the uh, retirement age from 65 to 66 in 2020. Well, that's not an enormous pace, but at least it is a breakthrough uh, in the thinking. Because in the Netherlands, uh, uh, we have seen quite some demonstrations uh, about uh, an increase in, in pension age. Um, well, we haven't seen them in the Netherlands, but it has everything to do with the fact that the people think, well, 10-year times, I mean, it will take my time, and uh, one year, it's okay. My expectation is that this was going to be much, much quicker. I think that uh, uh, an increase of the retirement age will, will take place in, in a few years, and I think a debate about uh, uh, 66 will go to 67, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the second point is um, that they want to have a more shock-proof uh, uh, pension scheme, 
and that has everything to do with what I showed you, that the, the pension benefits will become more and more dependent on uh, investment returns. I mean, in a fully funded system, if you are successful, if you are successful, they will depend more and more on investment returns. And that means that you need some flexibility in your pension benefits that if there is a credit crisis, and also in the credit crisis in the Netherlands, pension, fully funded pension funds lost some 20% of their assets, that you have to be able to adjust somewhat the pension benefits. And if you do that, you cannot, and that is absolutely a big issue in the Netherlands, you cannot do that overnight. You have to communicate the fact that pension benefits are less secure as people always thought. And for me, the top one priority within the, the, the pension business, so to say, is communication, communication, and communication. We have to communicate to people much more that their holiday on the Caribbean is maybe less secure than they thought. Now, what about Europe? If you look to, uh, uh, to Europe, and, and we've just heard that the situation on, on the aging of the European population, pensions will become more and more important. And here you see that the coverage of occupational pension schemes, so fully funded pension schemes in Europe, is on average rather poor. And I think that, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm on that point, I'm, I'm very much pleased with the, with the Green Paper, which stress also the importance, as I understand it well, for an increased importance of a second pillar system in Europe as well. But as you can see from this slide, something has to be done. If, I'm, uh, if I look to the green paper, I think there are a few items that are indeed in, important. I think that it is absolutely uh, important that uh, Europe will get an um, a adequate and appropriate solvency regime for IORPS, but I think that this uh, solvency regime should certainly recognize the specific positions of pension funds. And insurance companies and insurance risks are fundamentally different from uh, the risks that are faced by, by, by pension funds. If you look to the conditionality of uh, pension rights, the duration of the product portfolios of pension funds, it is clear that we must distinguish between the Solvency II regime of insurance companies and a solvency regime for uh, pension funds. Well, the, third, the second point uh, I would like to mention is, of course, the sustainable public finance uh, via uh, uh, financial discipline. It is clear, and I must say, that the biggest challenge for uh, fully funded pension funds in the, in, in, in the second pillar is, of course, inflation. That is the danger, and that is for everybody who saves money at the end, the danger for your savings is inflation. Now, we have seen the debt ratios in Europe, and we have seen the debt ratios in other parts of the world. And we know that if you want to solve them, you need fiscal discipline. And we know that at the end, it's not only fiscal discipline that's going to solve this debt ratio, but it also will be inflation. And if it's going to be inflation, of course, that absolutely will undermine the, the outcomes of the pension benefits of the, 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 the second pillar. And the third is a rather specific element, but I would like to make it, and that has everything to do with the fact that, like, uh, uh, that pension funds, uh, to hedge their um, exchange risk, to hedge their inflation risk, to hedge their interest risk, also use financial derivatives. And they do it on an OTC basis. But nowadays, there are plans within the European Union, within the European Commission, to try to advocate a more central system where, uh, for instance, pension funds should be 
uh, treated in the same way as an end user of these products, uh, like, for instance, bank and insurance companies. And that, of course, will create quite a problem for uh, 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 pension funds, not in the least because, for instance, in the Dutch case, this is going to cost a very big amount of money. And I'm not talking about millions, but I'm talking about billions in this uh, case. Money that is going to be uh, lost by pension funds and is going to harm, at the end, of course, the pension benefits of uh, uh, ordinary people in, uh, in our country. So, uh, as you understand, we are not very much in favor of that. If you have the next slide. Yes, let me, uh, let me conclude um, with a, a statement about uh, the Green Paper. Uh, I would like to say that uh, we welcome, and uh, certainly after hearing the speech of uh, Commissioner Andor, the holistic approach uh, uh, taken by the Commission. And um, also after uh, one of the questions, I would try uh, an approach that is also rightly based on the principle of, uh, of subsidiarity, because we all know that pension systems across Europe are, uh, are quite, uh, are quite uh, uh, different. But as I said, I hope that within an adequate solvency regime, we absolutely distinguish between, on the one hand, insurance companies, and on the other hand, uh, pension funds. Um, I think that uh, we share the common interest uh, with you all about pension funds, and um, that's the reason that we as a company, as uh, APG, recognize that uh, uh, Brussels uh, regulation is predominant and therefore our company since a number of months is also represented in Brussels in the heart of the European district at the Schumann Square um, and I would like to welcome you all at our networking event on the 23rd of May and where we can continue our discussions and you again are all very welcome because I think the challenge pension challenge that lies ahead of us surely needs quite some debate. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Slimers, and you certainly took up the challenge uh, that was posed to you by Mr. Martins. You suggested that the Dutch might have the golf courses all to themselves. Maybe then you will think you're the best golfers in the world as well as the best footballers. Anyway... <laughs> Um, and, and I think your, your final comment certainly should provoke some debate where you spoke about a solvency regime and the need to distinguish between insurance schemes and pension funds. I'm sure that will provoke some debate. Our final speaker in this session this morning is Mr. Henri Lourdel, who's advisor to the European Trade Union Confederation. Mr. Lourdel. Merci, madame. Thank you. We want, you wanted an open debate. Well, it is clear that most of what I say will be rather iconoclastic compared to what we've just heard. I do belong to this group of future pensioners, which, who, who certainly won't have the money to go and play golf in uh, the Balearic Islands. I may be able to afford to go to Coxida or La Panne in the Belgian coast, but I and my colleagues won't be able to afford to go to the Balearic Islands to play golf. Having said that, so much the better for the few privileged people who can afford to do that. Another thing, compared to what I've heard, I represent the people who pay into the pension system workers. We pay in. When you talk about companies' uh, contributions, what the companies pay into the system uh, doesn't, the workers don't get anyway. So I just wanted to say this to put my w words into context. Having said that, I'd like to thank the group for organizing this open debate. Uh, as you uh, realize, I'm not going to be telling the same story. It's also very stimulating because it leads us to reflect. I'm also pleased that the Commission 
has started this consultation. The ETUC is pleased with the consultation because a number of problems can be put on the table, but with one qualification. It's true that the Commission has received some 1,700 replies, but one should distinguish between individual replies, even if they're full of inspiration, and responses like that from us, the TUC, which uh, represents 60 million workers. So you have to give each reply its own value. I, I, I just make that comment in passing. Now, I was asked to talk about sustainability and uh, adequation which, uh, of pensions, which has perhaps strange terms, but what do the men and women I represent propose to ensure sustainability and to make sure that we have decent pensions, adequate pensions? Well, first, there is one good solution which people put forward which we think is false, i.e. increasing the legal retirement age. I told you I'd be iconoclastic. In fact, for us, what does that mean? Raising the statutory retirement age. What does that mean? In 2011, t telling older workers they have to work longer is rather curious because these same workers don't even work till the, leg the legal retirement age. They tend to retire earlier anyway. People always tend, in all of our European countries, retire early. The Commission recognizes this. Less than 50% of citizens are still working at the age 60. So what's the point of raising the retirement age? Uh, it's budgetary juggling. It is uh, postponing the problem without resolving it. It is moving from uh, paying out pensions to paying out unemployment benefits or uh, invalidity benefits or sickness benefits. We see that in some countries there was a very high invalidity rate compared to others. Well, I thought perhaps the climate's bad in these countries or perhaps in the polders you've, you live with your feet in the, in, in the water and it's bad for your health. No, what, what, what happens is that instead of retiring people, you make them invalid. And it's not good enough just to decree to people or to dictate to people that they should work longer. Because jobs have to exist, the work has to exist. You, you said that we'd need 2% growth. Well, I accept that we need growth, but there's more to it than that. And do jobs exist? Does work exist? That's partly the responsibility of companies, because experience tells me that unless you can prove the contrary, usually it's companies who recruit and also who fire. So it's... And they have a managerial strategy about the age of their staff, but there is also a responsibility on states, member states, they have to look at their planning policies, development policies, etc. And of course, one must also recognize that, that today we tend to say individuals must be responsible. We tend to blame individuals when the cause actually is structural. Increasing the pension age for everybody would ignore the fact that some people started working very young and they've paid into the pension system for a long time. And you shouldn't forget the, 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 the hard 
jobs that some people do as well. Uh, they work in uh, harsh conditions sometimes and, and, and they can't do it when they're old. We are assuming that workers are able to do these jobs longer and to do new jobs. It is all part of our develop, uh, employment development strategy, of course, it all, which will require investment. And it will mean that there has to be investment in training, lifelong training, which will uh, allow people to adjust to different skills or to, to learn new skills. It uh, means we have to look at working conditions, we have to look at our active population. And when people lose their jobs, we have to try and find new jobs for them. It's no use, no use just telling people you have to work. We have to give them training, we have to give them skills, and we have to give them a decent uh, uh, wage and also a decent benefit while they're in between jobs. And that is what we, uh, social partners, employers and DTUC, signed on the 25th of March last for an inclusive labour market. On the 25th of March, we signed an agreement, employers and um, unions, to make the labour market more inclusive. But if you just focus on the work of the older people in a company, you shouldn't sh forget another dramatic situation, that is that of young people today who can't find a job. Of course. You can uh, prolong studies to 25, as, as you said in your graph, but what happens when you reach the age of 26? There's no work. You're unemployed. You're desperate. And you're young. That's bad. That's bad for us. So age management is not just the retirement age. We have to manage the time, the age when people start work. We have to, therefore, provide work. So, increasing the statutory uh, retirement age just like that for us is not a credible solution. However, increasing the effective or real age when people stop working is something else that's different. But there are conditions, the conditions I've already mentioned. We have to guarantee a decent pension. And we have to guarantee quality jobs and quality wages because it's only with quality jobs and quality wages that you can finance social protection and therefore pensions. Someone, I think the Commissioner mentioned this, said that, that there's a demographic challenge. Well, yes. We all know that we're getting older. Uh, I've got uh, grey hair, and it's real. I, I didn't die at grey, it's real. We are living longer, and that's a good thing. But what is important is not the demographic ratio, the number of births and deaths. What interests me is not the number of um, babies in maternity hospitals, because there are countries around us which are not very rich, which have a very high birth rate, which have a very high population of young people just cross over the Mediterranean. But I'm going to stay in the European context. If I look at Turkey, their demographic uh, ratio is very different to ours. But there are still not enough jobs. So the real problem is the ratio of economic dependence, the ratio between those who have work, who are providing wealth, who are driving growth, and those who either still don't have a job or no longer have a job. And that's where we have to act, we believe. That's what we should be working on. In other words, the quality of jobs. When I say quality of jobs, I mean jobs which are not precarious and a decent wage. 
And if I look at the projections uh, for population, I won't make any friends here, uh, but that's not a problem. I would like to remind you that the longer the project projections are, the more distant they are, 2050, 2060, the less reliable they are. Projections have never been predictions, and predictions are never right anyway. Certainly we can take certain parameters, but beyond 20, 25 years, I think it's unreliable. The proof is that if you look over the past 10 years, most countries have had to change their demographic projections. In France is in a diff it was in a difficult situation some 10 years ago. Now um, there are more births. So the real battle, and this is what the, 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 our fight, we are campaigning for more and better jobs, for more uh, for, for for better wages. Nowadays, people enter the labor market much later and leave it much earlier. I do have grey hair, but I remember my youth. And uh, we had a saying that you're burning the candle at both ends. Well, that's what's happening. So that's a real problem. Now, adequate pensions, how do we achieve that? Well, as I said, it means quality jobs, quality wages. I'm, I'm certain about that. I'm not certain about the demographic projections, but I'm certain about that. A man, a, 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 a worker, a man or a woman, a poor man or woman, will be a poor pensioner. So let's not have the wrong debate here. The Green Paper has launched a debate, which is technical, but it's highly political as well, because these are fundamental issues. It's not just little measurements and adjustments, even though some technical adjustments may be necessary. It's political, and I'll end on this point which might be contradict what we've heard, but it's, it's worth saying it. We want a, an open debate. It was said that we shouldn't put all our eggs in the same basket. That's a question of governance. So we should multiply the, 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 the stages of, of pension. Of course, we, the social partners, are involved in that in the second pillar. We want it to be as good, the best possible. But having said that, If we have a multiplication of pillars, is that a response? Is that a way of guaranteeing sustainable pensions? I won't talk about the effects of the crisis and how that's affected uh, pension funds. That's been mentioned. Some pension funds lost a lot of money. But there is one specific point I would like to focus on. This today could multiply the stages of a pension. We have 20 million unemployed. We have millions of workers on low wages, poor workers. Who, who benefits from this diversification? Is it some 20 or 30 percent who can uh, spend their retirement on, in, on the golf course or in the uh, uh, Canary Islands. It's, it, it's, the, it's only those men and women who have and enough money to save money. They've paid for a house, they've had to educate their children, they've had to pay for a car etc., etc. I am winding up. And uh, 
they have to have a pretty high wage if they can still save up for their retirement. And we talk a lot about budgetary austerity at the moment, but what strikes me is that often, even if the commissioner was very cautious in his reply to the uh, lady journalist, the, the, the private pension systems should be encouraged by tax breaks for X euros into my pension fund. I should get an X euro reduction in my tax. This is a, something we wonder about in the ATUC. It's a question of good management of public expenditure. R rather than this tax break for the 20 or 30 percent better off, at the same time we are uh, implementing budget cuts. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all players. Uh, we all have influence. My conclusion is that we mustn't have the wrong debate. We must tackle the problem at its so source, at its root. We must guarantee financing and sustainability and solidarity of pension systems. We must guarantee this through developing, creating good jobs. So it means putting social policy at the heart of our European strategy, at the heart of our 2020 strategy. Isn't that the way to reconcile uh, things and to involve citizens in European construction, which is too often perceived to be purely economic? Thank you very much. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you, Mr. Lurdell. It was certainly worth our while being patient. Um, and you, your comments certainly will ensure an open debate. Some of the fault lines are drawn. So we're already behind time. So I'm giving exactly five minutes and um, four questions. So if anybody has a question to any of the panelists, please, I ask, be very brief. And we have five minutes. Yes. <coughs> I'm a Belgian. I'm a member of the uh, Complementary Pensions Commission. I'm administra uh, an uh, administrator in one of the biggest Belgian pension funds. I just have three brief comments. I listened to Mr. Dick Slimers. His paper was written before a broadcast, which was very critical of the Dutch pension system. And the image we give is often falsified. I give the example of Belgium and, or, or the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, you have the VAO if in Belgium. If you get more than 10,000 euros to each pensioner, more than in, in the Netherlands, then you'd have a different system to know. And secondly, we shouldn't forget that, n that not everything depends on funded or pay-as-you-go systems, to use the classic vocabulary, but it also depends on what we do and the risks we run. I worked for six years in the National Bank, and I know very well to what extent surveillance is important, but also as a pensioner, I am a pensioner, it's important to know what the risks, what risks are being taken, whether it's insurance companies, banks, or pension funds, what risks are they taking, because they do take risks, and we must avoid these risks destroying the system. Thank you. Um, I, I, is there any question for any member of the panel? No? Okay, just very briefly, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question for uh, Mr. Uh, Slimmers. Sorry, I probably mispronounced that. Um, I just wondered if you could expand on why you believe the pension 
pensions should be treated differently from insurance, particularly bearing in mind that d derivatives uh, p had quite a, a strong role to play in the recent financial crisis. Thank you. Well, that has everything to do with, uh, with the way, of course, pension funds use derivatives. I mean, pension funds only use derivatives to hedge their risks, and there is nothing about, uh, there is no speculative behavior of, uh, of, of pension funds. And what they do is try to hedge their, their, their inflation risks, to hedge their interest risks, to hedge their foreign exchange risks. And uh, they do it nowadays on a, uh, well, on a very professional basis on, on the, on the uh, on the OTC, uh, uh, with an OTC instrument. And of course we understand the idea that it would be wise to have a more transparent and centralized system, but if you see the conditions on basis on what uh, pension funds are required to, to join that system, that is, uh, uh, well, uh, I believe that was a, there was an article that said um, Sometimes it's good to, to, to have a one-size-fits-all, but on this issue it's absolutely not that one-size-fits-all. There is a clear distinction between end users as pension funds who do not speculate with derivatives, they only use it to hedge their risk, and other financial institutions, and I think you should distinguish that, certainly because it's becoming very, very costly for pension funds. Thank you very much. We're going to finish the first panel Oh, we, all right. We have just one. Sorry, maybe yes. the gentleman who, and, and I, I strongly uh, uh, agree with him, said that he thinks that um, uh, pension funds, but not only pension funds, but also insurance companies, and I would like to add also governance, should make very transparent to their participants what type of risk they take. And I, I said already that uh, uh, certainly if uh, the benefits will, uh, pension benefits in the future will depend more and more on the, on the returns made on the assets of pension funds that uh, uh, the, the outcome will become uh, less secure than a lot of people think and that our number one priority is communication, communication and again communication and on that point I fully agree with you. I apologise, I'm simply unable to take any questions. We've run well over, but uh, Mr. Martins, I think, wants one minute. Uh, it was just to say to Mr. Uh, Monsieur Lourdel, uh, be a little bit careful of uh, dismissing the problem by dismissing the forecast, because actually the best forecast we ever have is on the demographics. And you have to think about the fact that a lot of the, the, the future workforce is already born. We know who they are, right? <laughs> But uh, I also want to say there is one insecurity here, and that is the figures about uh, migration, because as I said, these are politically uh, difficult. And then just on the gray hair, this is not just the fall of the older people, it's also the fall of the younger people who doesn't get enough babies. So I just want to tell you that in the 60s, we had a slogan saying, make love, not war. I'm now saying make love and babies. Thank you. <laughs> just a 30-second response, and then we finish. Just very briefly, I was trying to say that you have to be very cautious about the forecast, especially as you get longer term, because we've seen that those who deal with demographics have often got it very wrong indeed. So if you've got an indicator, you can try to see what you can extrapolate from that. But if you're going to justify reforms on that basis, that is very risky. So I did warn you that I was going to uh, cause some controversy and it's good, I think, that I did, but you have to keep everything in perspective, always. Thank you. Mr. Lord Allen, you've given us the last word. You're suspicious of those who look too far into the future. So we're now ready to go to our second panel, and I'm very pleased to hand over to my <coughs> colleague, uh, Mr. Dirk Sturks, who will moderate this panel, Dirk. So four members of uh, this second panel, two people from the Commission, uh, someone from Höchst, German company, and uh, someone from the European Federation of Retirement Provision. Um, on, I think, two of the most controversial points in what we're discussing now, which is mobility and solvency. 
So I'm not going to wait much longer because time is limited. So I would ask you, we have four members in this panel, not three. Uh, you have to be shorter than the ones before us. Um, and Mr. Van Hulle, you are first. Well, thank you very much and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have produced some slides which you can look at uh, at ease, but I will be, in the interest of time, make a short presentation. I was asked to talk particularly to the topic of pension funds and solvency rules. The first thing I want to say here is that we need to be very careful when we use the word pension fund because the same expression covers many different realities. And that's the first thing we have to keep in mind. Not all pension funds carry their liabilities on the balance sheet. And I'm talking here, of course, only about those pension funds that offer guarantees, that offer, for instance, defined benefit schemes for the pensioners, for their members. But not all these pension funds carry the liabilities on the balance sheet because sometimes the liability remains with the employer. And that is, for instance, the case with the UK pension funds, where the employer carries the liability on his balance sheet, so it is not the liability of the pension fund itself. The second thing I, I wanted to say is that not all pension funds promise a guarantee. Many pension funds offer defined contribution plans, which means that they don't have a liability. When the pension funds directive was adopted, the so-called IORP directive, it referred those pension funds that carry their liabilities on their balance sheets, it referred those pension funds to the solvency regime called Solvency I, which is the regime that equally applies to life assurance companies because there is a similarity between the two. Now, Solvency I is a system that is full of problems. For instance, under Solvency I, the risk involved in investment is not taken into account in calculating the solvency margin. Now, you can imagine risk involved in investments. This is a major piece of risk, and that's not the case under Solvency One. That's the reason why the Commission has proposed a new solvency regime for all insurance and reinsurance companies, which is called Solvency Two. And Solvency Two, very simply, these two aspects I want to, to uh, mention here. Solvency II, like Basel II, the, the framework for the banks, has three pillars. The first pillar deals with the quantitative requirements, such as a solvency capital requirement. The second pillar deals with governance, deals with prudential supervision, the supervisory review by supervisory authorities. And the pillar three deals with disclosure, transparency, market conduct. Solvency two is also a fully risk-based solvency regime. It takes account of all the risks on the asset side, investments for instance, and the liability side. When we proposed Solvency II, and the directive was adopted by Parliament and Council in 2009, the framework directive, we did not include pension funds under its scope. Again, only those pension funds, ladies and gentlemen, that carry the liabilities in the balance sheet. The others are not concerned with this. Why did we do that? We did not include them because we felt that before doing so, we needed to do a quantitative impact assessment. We needed to check what would be the impact if we were to do that on the pension funds. And that's the reason why in the Green Paper, which the Commission published last year, we specifically asked all stakeholders the question, what do you think? Should we develop an appropriate solvency regime also for pension funds? Again those pension funds that carry the liabilities in the balance sheet. 
Of course, the answers to that question were mixed. You can see it in my slides. Of course, some people say no and some people say yes, and other people say in between. But a big message that came out of the response is that if we were to do so, we needed to take account of the particularities of the pension funds and the pension promise. And there is indeed a lot to say for developing rules that take account, as Mr. Slurmus was saying, the flexibility of the pension promise, a difference between a life assurance contract where both sides are bound by a contract and can't change it is different from a pension promise, which is the result of a negotiation between the employer and the employees, and which will lead to a situation whereby the partners, the social partners, can at one point in time decide, we want to change, you know, for the better or for the worse. But that, ladies and gentlemen, has important consequences for the Solvency regime. It reduces the need to have the capital buffer, which is the fear of pension funds that if we introduce solvency to, to them, to their regime, that they would have to hold too much capital. So to conclude, Mr. Chairman, the Commission, following up the Green Paper, is going to ask EOPA, the new authority for insurance and pensions, to develop some thinking about how we can amend the pension funds directive also, not exclusively, also in the area of the solvency rules. And to look at how we can have a regime whereby same risks are treated in the same way, at the pension side and insurance side. The Commission will receive their reports. We will then analyze it, consult about it. We'll organize a public hearing on the 22nd of September, and we hope that we can manage to come out with a proposal in December 2011. That is the plan. So I hope, Mr. Chairman, that that is a briefly expose what the situation is. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Hulle. And thank you very much for giving us, in a very short time, a good overview of where the problems are. I give the floor now to uh, Mr. Schwind. Yes, thank you very much. Um, for having the chance. Uh, vielen Dank, dass ich hier zu Ihnen sprechen darf. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here to uh, speak to you. I represent one of the uh, oldest and biggest uh, pension uh, setups. It was founded in 1986, and I represent the stakeholders that stand to be affected by the green paper. Something happening in Europe which is very important is demographic change. We're also seeing, of course, uh, structural problems, the current crisis, the fact that a lot of risk is being shifted now onto individuals, into ordinary people. And I think that uh, all in all, we have to see how we can stop old people falling into poverty. We've heard from Mr. Martins in particular how dramatically things are going to change as people are getting older and older and will continue to get even older. And we're going to have fewer and fewer active persons having to support uh, retired persons as we go into the future. I've got some graphs here from the EU. If uh, you consider the present age quotient of 0 0.4, that is going to be changing to 0 0.8 before too long if things carry on in the same, in the same way. And that, of course, is going to be an intolerable uh, cost burden if we don't do something about it beforehand. Germany is going to be shrinking, France is going to grow, as will the UK in demographic terms. Uh, Italy, Spain will more or less maintain the status quo. So if you look at this other block graph, you can see just how dramatically the developments are likely to be. Now, this is incredibly important because right now, economic recovery and 
evolution is different in our different countries and demographic change is different in our different countries as well. So if you have the principle of subsidiarity applying, it's really the only way you can tackle this because you will need to find different solutions given that the problems differ between the different countries. So if you look at the EU sustainability report, we have this graph here which shows the likely increase in state indebtedness if we do not introduce change and do so drastically and rapidly. And we're going to have to see how we can manage the national debt with the levels of indebtedness indebtedness that we have at the moment um, to stop things getting completely out of control. If you look at the situation in Germany, that of course I base myself on, we have a three-pillar system in Germany, as you can see. We've got our state pension system. You've also got company pensions, which uh, tends to be based on funded uh, pension schemes. And then you've also got uh, funded schemes, which are purely private. These figures, these uh, different pillars are no longer as nicely balanced as they were. You've already heard about this. In Holland, of course, things are quite different because you can compare, looking at this table, the similarities between the first and second pillar, but in Germany, which up until 2000 was the pillar that was going to ensure that you had a decent standard of living, you can see now that uh, changes are occurring and this is not going to stay the same. If you look at this graph, you can see just how different things are between the different countries. And across the whole world, you've got the USA here. You've got a lot being drawn from the third pillar. But uh, that is an old age pension, which in the US means that a lot of people haven't got enough to live on and are obliged to work for that much longer to uh, top up the difference. So where is the correct balance? We've got a pretty uh, broad cover in the Netherlands, you've got collectively bargained agreements in the Netherlands and in Switzerland uh, under the legislation. You have to have, under the law, you have to have uh, sufficient cover so that there should not be people uh, falling between the gaps. We're seeing at the moment a move to increase the age of retirement to 67. That's the first uh, move. We've uh, also reduced the absolute volume of uh, payout on pensions. And we're also introducing changes as of the 1st of January 2012 for the first moment at which you would be entitled to start drawing a pension. If we see a shrinking of the first uh, pillar, we're obviously going to have to make good elsewhere. There was the wish, of course, to maintain the level of pensions so that people do not suddenly become poor. But this is why we feel it's right to call for a top-up system through private pensions, which would be an added construct. But ideally, and this was in fact my question to Mr. Andor, how the different elements can all fit together to provide an ideal system of benefits. We uh, do fear that with the different uh, benefits that are being paid out uh, at the moment, we are going to have to be very strict about ensuring that all benefits, including uh, invalidity and other benefits alongside pensions, will be fully funded in the future so that we will not have a problem in being able to cover the uh, payouts. We don't believe necessarily that everything should uh, come under the uh, personalized uh, third pillar, but we do have to be very careful. What has happened in Germany? In 2002, 
we agreed in Germany that the first pillar would just be your base. We would increase the second pillar. So there is a legal entitlement to company pensions for every single employee. It was previously possible for the company to decide whether they would run a pension scheme or not, but this was then changed so that every employee would be entitled to a company pension. And uh, that would be through a state-organized conversion of capital contributions. And the result of that was we were more or less able to cover all branches and sectors through collectively bargained arrangements for pensions. And in fact, in the chemical industry, 2010 was the first year when we undertook a large-scale analysis of uh, the actuarial inputs that would affect uh, pension schemes and the possibility of payouts and also how we could ensure the transition phase from an active working life to retirement. The program has been quite successful. So you can see now how company pension schemes have multiplied and expanded. And all of this, starting from 2002, as I've said, shows you just uh, how much improvement has been achieved. We're up to 65%. And uh, I think the expansion was really substantial because those who are involved and have a stake in this have taken it very seriously. And I think we need to continue along this uh, path because there are a lot of people in Europe who are not satisfactorily covered. How does this actually pan out in Germany? We've got uh, five different possibilities. The uh, pension uh, funds themselves, the uh, supplementary support funds, We've got uh, actually the uh, pension funds being the main means of uh, managing the money, which is the funding for the pensions. And uh, we've got uh, all sorts of rules now for the various uh, elements of a working life and the various different benefits that are covered by these funds. There's one special characteristic of these funds. They are regulated nationally. And under the law, employers have to ensure that only workers will be covered for their pensions who have been paying in contributions. And it's forbidden to uh, levy any cost deductions on these. And uh, across the board, these uh, Pensions are supposed to apply or rather the decisions to be taken by these uh, funds have to involve the workers themselves. There's a whole, a whole raft of uh, legislation which applies to these. I'm trying to be as quick as possible here to come to an end. We're trying to see how the employers and how companies will see to it that sufficient pension funding is there for all the workers. There's a lot of legislation for transparency and quality elements which uh, have meant that there have been real improvements. We are most probably going to need a lot of uh, extra money because as we've already heard, uh, as we're only covering under those uh, funds actual pensions, 
but because there will be uh, more people taking up these uh, pensions, we will need considerably more additional money. And whether this will come from the uh, balance sheet, workers, of course, as well as the employers are all stakeholders here. So the question is whether, because there will be this need for additional money, we might not see our balance sheets going into the red. And this could mean that we would be obliged to reduce benefits or possibly people fearing that their pension would be reduced would pull out of the fund. I think we need to uh, always base ourselves on the principle of subsidiarity. We're in favor of uh, funded pensions and we want to also ensure portability, transferability of uh, pensions from one place to another. And the EU should be aiming to model itself on best practices as exists uh, across the EU. So summing up and to conclude, I would say that we need to promote company pension schemes covering uh, all uh, workers and ensuring that there's enough money in the pot to be able to cover everyone and the stakeholders who are both the employers and the workers should not have to uh, suffer because of a lack of foresight. Mrs. Ferrari, do you have a Thank you, Chair. Uh, my thanks uh, go to the AL ALDE group uh, for having organized this uh, very timely meeting indeed. And uh, also I, I want to thank uh, your group uh, for having invited the EFRP to this floor. The Green Paper on Pensions, in our view, is a strategic paper raising fundamental questions and going beyond the, uh, the to-do list of the Commission. I believe this Parliament is now on its way to, have, uh, to deliver a good report and providing valuable leads for the Commission to work on. And I hope the Commission will take it uh, into account. Considering the 1,673 responses to the Green Paper, I think the main recommendation for the Commission there is to carefully consider the diversity of the pension systems as well as, as the diversity of the vehicles and the diversity of the schemes. So in short, please take uh, note and please deal with diversity. When I read the draft report of the Parliament, um, then I see a number of very interesting and even compelling recommendations for the Commission. The Parliament stresses the diversification of pension income from a mix of public first pillar and work-related, in most cases second pillar, schemes to provide adequate pension provision. This is set in paragraph 17. And in 42, the draft uh, recalls that the Commission should make proposals for promoting work-related pensions. The Commission should also could, uh, come up with a typology of pension systems, as well as with a common set of definitions and criteria in order to make pensions comparable. And we will see why it is so important. This is paragraph 10. And the Commission should facilitate the establishment of national tracing systems for work-related pensions, in paragraph 38, this, simultaneously submit proposals for a European tracing system, in paragraph 39. The report repeatedly requests the Commission to make impact assessments. First range is before revising the IRP directive in paragraph 32. And also those impact assessments should quantify additional costs and administrative burdens from legislative proposals. This is set twice in paragraph 40 and 50. So I would say there is real meat uh, to this uh, report and we hope uh, the Commission will uh, take due note of it. Apart from the time pressure here in the Parliament that give us concern, 
We want to draw your attention to the fact that the large majority of stakeholders, including the social partners, are hugely concerned that concepts b borrowed from insurance legislation would be applied to work-related pensions. Those concepts and principles focus short-term security and hence cannot be applied to long-term oriented pension institutions. Relying, relying solely on capital requirements as a risk absorption mechanism for pension institutions seems inadequate for EFRP. Such an approach will hamper economic growth by pumping capital out of the market to store it unproductively without significantly improving beneficiaries' protection or security over the long term. So I was asked to speak also on mobility to expand somewhat on that, and that is what I will do now. Many people, even experts, understate the complexities of mobility of pensions. And I will focus on the mobility, therefore, of the second pillar pensions. Those are pension arrangements provided in the, or arranged by an employer or a company. A first insight one needs to understand is that pension rights cannot be transferred. Pension capital can be transferred. A second insight is acquisition, vesting and preservation rules belong to the national social and labor law. And pension rights are benefits that are provided under an employment contract. By leaving the employer, those benefits can no longer be provided under such a contract. And as long as labor law continues to be considered as a member state competence, we don't see why part of the labor law should be brought under an EU level harmonized regime, while other parts of the labor law continue to be member state specific. It seems inconsistent to us. And therefore, one should not pursue harmonization at all costs of these rules of work-related pensions. Taking these insights into account, the first question to deal with is what is the nominal, the discounted value, in fact, of the pension entitlements, not rights, um, at the moment of the transfer? We have to make a distinction here between DC and DB schemes. In defined contribution schemes, the answer is relatively simple and requires no complex actuarial calculations. The entitlements are the sum of the contributions plus the investments returns minus costs. In DB schemes, on the contrary, the calculation of entitlements become, becomes rather complex. Entitlements are determined by a formula that can incorporate the employee's final or average uh, salary the years of employment, the age at which um, the scheme foresees retirement, indexation requirements, and still other factors. This calculation process cannot be organized at European level since it's not only member state specific, but also scheme specific. When dealing with transfers in a DB scheme, it is important to consider also the interests of those people that remain in the scheme and that don't ask for a transfer. And I think in particular to schemes in which the underfunding in such situations transfers could be disruptive for the scheme and put remaining members of the scheme at a disadvantage. A second question that needs to be answered is where to transfer to? And here also we have to make a difference between internal transfers, that means transfers within a member state and across member states. So within a member state, in such a situation, it's rather easy to identify the appropriate vehicle. Even if the new employer does not offer a second pillar scheme, Citizens normally are familiar with the role of the various pension institutions in the country in which they work. Between member states, a cross-border transfer, this amounts to a more difficult issue. If the new employer offers a scheme, the most obvious way would be the pension vehicle of the new employer. 
If the new employer does not offer a scheme, workers need to identify the appropriate vehicle in the new member state. This can be problematic and may require guidance from private consultants. And to assist citizens and employers alike, we need an EU-wide matrix as an instrument to facilitate cross-border transfers. And also the Parliament seems to draw this conclusion. A third question that needs to be answered is, which, question which pension entitlements do you get from the transferred capital? This operation is also only relevant for DB schemes. Also here, as for transfer outs, the calculation formula is complex. We don't see skip, scope for harmonizing it at EU level, as long as social and labor law remain a member state competence. Having analyzed those key aspects involved in the transfer process, I assume you will agree that at least it is complex and technical. So what can be done to facilitate the process for the citizens? First of all, as said, develop an EU typology of pension system, a European matrix from which inter alias citizens and administrations can identify to which pension institution they can transfer their pension capital. Secondly, remove discriminatory barriers for tax barriers for pension transfers. Tax requirements need to be considered in both DB and DC situations. Although tax law is also largely a member state competence, the European Court of Justice has delivered some very helpful decisions, especially for contributions to work-related pension schemes. But still, for the transfers um, during career, there are still problems for um, ta in taxation area. So do we really have to focus on transfers? This is a perfectly legitimate question. Given the complexity of the process, some experts uh, advocate to try the preservation route and to try to keep the rights in the system, in the pension scheme, with an appropriate, but it should be really an appropriate register and tracing system. This is an interesting suggestion, I think, and uh, we should also consider that member states has taken, have taken this route well the, in the regulation for the mobility of the first pillar uh, pensions. And so if we want to take this further, it will require well-developed and further developed infrastructure at member state level, as well as interconnectivity between member states' systems. And also, under such an approach, an EU27 pension typology becomes even more compelling. Ladies and gentlemen, the Green Paper has identified the right issues and challenges. The moment is there to give the holistic process started by the Green Paper time to unfold. We hope the Commission will hear our call for full-scale impact assessments, quantifying additional costs and administrative burdens of any legislative proposal in this area. It is key that European employers, while staying competitive worldwide, can continue, can continue to sponsor work-related pensions and, more importantly, widen the coverage of their pension schemes. Let us not forget that 60% of the European workforce does not benefit from a work-related pension scheme. We should facilitate and promote them, not stifle their development. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, The floor, Mr. van Northeim, is yours. Thank you very much. I think we should just start by recalling that we are discussing at very different levels here. The Green Paper spoke to the pension challenge in general, but it also spoke to the challenge of updating the EU framework for pensions, which is a much more limited technical issue for existing industries and existing provisions. Uh, for that reason, in order to allow you to look more into the details of the strategic issues, I had asked the Secretariat to put in your envelopes for this conference 
uh, the executive summary of this extensive study which the Economic Policy Committee and the Social Protection Committee did uh, together uh, of all member states and which led to council conclusions in November. There you will see the rich uh, uh, analysis and rich comments, rich suggestions for what to do in the strategic field. Now, the strategic field, of course, also comes into policy coordination. Basically, the EU framework consists of two things, policy coordination and regulation. And, of course, there's a very different time structure to it. And, of course, you should also note, all of you, that in policy coordination, we react more to the developments and events than to debate. Uh, what we are debating, and with a different time structure, is what we should do in regulation. Member states have already uh, almost made a lot of decisions, and as you heard from uh, Hans Martins and from Kiefer Hofstadt, uh, they're thinking way ahead in macro issues. So if we do get reinforced economic policy coordination, if the European semester does continue, as it was set off with the uh, annual growth survey comments on pensions, and if member states, without involving the Commission sets up a competitive pact, maybe of an intergovernmental character. Of course, in policy coordination, in terms of public budgets, it's a ball game way out of the Green Paper. So the Green Paper as a process also always had a problem of staying on the curve of how we develop. Uh, and this is important to remember that as we develop this uh, work in progress, which is the European Union's role in helping member states. There are different time structures and, and different things, and it's not as if member states are infringing or the Commission is infringing on what it intends with the Green Paper. We still want the debate. We also want the time structures, but there are also other things happening, and therefore sometimes we have to move quite fast. Um, I'm supposed to speak about portability and insolvency protection issues, and these are, of course, uh, technical issues, legal issues with a longer history. Uh, in portability, uh, the Commission started out uh, with communications back in 91. Uh, it had a, a, a group of wise men and women uh, report on this in 97. There was a, a very uh, low-key directive in 98. In 2005, we came back with a wider one which had transfers, uh, acquisition and preservation at its focus. Uh, Parliament told us transfers is technically uh, and politically uh, a non-starter. So we came back with another proposal in 2007 suggesting we focus on acquisition and preservation. And quite uh, frankly, uh, member states cannot agree on this. Uh, they have different historical legacies on preservation and acquisition, and they disagree in areas which you would think were sort of scientifically solved in terms of uh, what this vesting periods do to the idea of dynamic labor markets, which is hailed in modern labor uh, market economics. But uh, some member states are absolutely keen on preserving the way they tie employees uh, to certain employers through the pension arrangements, and other member states are dead set on exploding that way. Uh, so there's no way to have this. It's blocked before the Council. Uh, but portability and mobility, of course, is not any issue. And therefore, even though the Commission, of course, has this as important questions in the Green Paper, there is, in fact, two questions on that, six and seven. Um, it's not as if, if everybody in the Green Paper told us stay away, that this would be an option for the Commission. This is a, a structural responsibility for us as caretaker to develop the internal market for workers. And from the very start, we saw social protection as an important part of that. Now, with developments where member states increasingly uh, give a larger role to supplementary pensions in their total pension provision, and increasingly we open labor markets to uh, everybody, from the 1st of May, member states that joined in 2004 will have access to all labor markets. Um, it's, it's not possible if we are to have adequacy 
And if we are to have sufficient social protection of workers, just to leave it aside, we have to find ways uh, forward. Uh, not that we have them yet, but we will have to uh, act in some way here. And therefore, what I have to say is very different from what my good colleague said, because there, there's a clear college decision already, and there's a clear horizon on how to move, and, and we know our way forward. But uh, in this other area, we have to um, feel our way uh, forward. Um, of course, when member states disagree, it's not just legacies. It is, as any speaker from the industry has pointed out, it's about costs. Uh, and of course, no one wants to take on higher costs. Uh, so uh, these are legitimate interests that different uh, contenders put forward. We have to respect them, and we have to think if there is a way uh, between. Uh, Obviously, with the new treaty, uh, the legal base is shifting somewhat, but that doesn't quite give a new avenue. Um, then uh, there is what my colleague here suggested uh, from the ERFP, uh, that why not build on the best analogy we have? Why not look for a route that uh, builds on 883, the Social Security aggregation regime. And yes, maybe that, that it would seem to be uh, a way uh, forward that look to preservation. Uh, still, there are these agreements on acquisition, uh, which we, we cannot that quite we get, that, cannot got, get around, but maybe preservation is. So, of course, the Commission is also thinking of uh, the ver various instruments that are there. So, uh, we also have uh, social dialogue and we can have first stage consultations and so on. Maybe commissioners who go for that. As Mr. Ander told you, they met for the first time yesterday to sort of uh, pinpoint some of the policy options which they want to take to an impact assessment. I can assure everybody that, of course, we will not be able to move without impact assessment. So the, the uh, full analysis of responses is not uh, finished and is not published, obviously, because we are only seeing responses from European institutions coming in. And naturally, commissioners are more keen on seeing what the European Parliament has to say than on, on, on most other respondents. So that has to wait. But all the other responses have been published on the web before Christmas, and so you can peruse through them, you can browse through them. And here you will see that there was uh, uh, quite some support for the, 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 the thrust of the present directive, uh, uh, the idea of focusing on acquisition and preservation. Uh, but there was the warning calls uh, that... Uh, that uh, Maybe some things need to happen more at the national level than at the European level. Finally, the thing that uh, got support was the idea of the tracking service, which uh, also, uh, again here, most uh, want to try it at the national level before you go European. Yeah. Uh, a good idea. In insolvency protection, we have some of the same situation, but here we have a recent study on what uh, has worked and not worked in our legislation. And so here, one immediate response would be to say, let's try to improve the implementation of the existing directive, a route that is always there. But in general, I um, cannot be very specific on what we will do. Uh, in a few months, I hope it will be quite clear uh, as we work towards the white paper, the white paper will be published at the end of the third quarter. Uh, it's in the Commission work program, and commissioners are very keen on this. They want to do it jointly, as Mr. Ander uh, said. But let's remember, when you do something holistic, uh, of course, it takes in everything, but it also means it's very, very complex and it's difficult to hold together. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> We have a little bit less than half an hour for uh, debate, but before I open the, the floor for questions, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Michaela Koller of the insurance industries. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the ALDE group for organizing this conference. 
I'm Michaela Koller. I'm speaking on behalf of the European Insurance and Reinsurance Federation. I would like to focus my very brief remarks just on the current situation as we find them and as we will find them in the future as regards safety. Uh, for us, when we look at the, the picture that is painted in the pension field and the issues that we will have to address when offering pension products um, to the population, then we remark that you have various players that are active in providing pension solutions and pension products to the population. You have obviously the pension funds uh, that come in different shapes and forms with sponsors, without sponsors. You have pension funds with and without guarantees. You have obviously the insurance companies and you also have increasingly asset managers and asset management solutions that are offered. When we look at the regulatory environment, then we see marked differences between the three um, providers in the market. We see clearly that uh, insurance currently subject to Solvency 1 will move in 2013 to Solvency 2, which is a risk-based economic regime where you align your capital requirements to the risk that you are taking. On the pension fund side, we have pension funds who provide guarantees, and I have specifically focused my remarks on those, who are subject to Solvency 1, and if there is no revision addressing this issue, will remain subject to Solvency 1. And you have asset management um, solutions that are offered, also with guarantees, who currently are not subject to any capital requirement. Uh, rules. So when you look at the picture, what you see is, uh, at least in terms of the regulatory side, a marked difference between the different players in the market. And if you don't want to address it from a level playing field issue, clearly, I think from a beneficiary um, perspective, there is certainly reason to address it. I refer specifically to the remarks made uh, by the ad hoc um, representative who said, ultimately, these are the people who are paying the pensions. Now, is everything about solvency to golden and should it be applied one to one? Clearly, I think we need to have this debate. I don't think I um, disclose any secrets when I say that we are currently still in the final stages of the solvency two process. And in this process, um, based on very clear impact assessments, we see that a lot of things still need to be addressed, certainly when it comes to long-term issues. And there, clearly, the last word isn't spoken, and a lot of better solutions and improvements can be found. But we believe that we need to be open for this debate for all the pension providers, and that we need to find the appropriate solutions. So I want to underline we are not asking for Solvency 2 to be applied to pension funds one-to-one, -one, but we would suggest that the debate is organized on all three pillars in Solvency 2, quantitative, qualitative, and also the um, disclosure requirements to see to what extent they can be sensibly addressed also for pension funds with guarantees to assure regulatory level playing field and also to make sure that in the end the beneficiaries get the pension promise that they have received in the beginning. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the time. Thank you. And now the floor is open to questions. We have, let's say, 20 minutes, a little bit more. Who bites off the head, as we say in Dutch? No one. Uh, in that case, I should call catering because they they're only prepared at 12 o'clock. But we have, so we have to move on. The journalist again will save us. Well, I'm not sure this question really merits that, but um, I, I wanted to ask. Sorry, um, I wanted to ask Mr. Van Hula if he could um, give me perhaps a little bit more information on the proposal to amend the pensions directive in terms of transparency, which I've just flicked through your, your presentation notes. I don't think you had time to cover that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> we, we believe that it is very important that we improve the European framework also in terms of communicating 
to members of pension funds what they will finally get as a pension. I think that is one of the problems today, and we heard this in the, in the other panel too, communication, communication. I think people have a right to know, when I retire as a member of this pension fund, what will I get? What is going to be my income? We're always talking today about returns. I put so much in there, and that's the return. But I would like to know, when I retire, what my likely income is going to be. And I think that in terms of these benefits that come out of the system, there's still a long way to improve the transparency about that. Also transparency, very importantly, uh, about, we already have some, but it is, you know, old days, uh, transparency about the way pension funds carry out their investments. What are the structure? How do they operate? Um, how do they take account of the risks? How do they manage their risks? How are they governed? Hmm? It's sometimes said that the members who are on the board of pension funds, that they prefer to invest in each other's companies and things like that. That's being said. I don't know whether that's true. But anyway, it would be use, useful also to know a little bit more about how these strategies are employed. Can I just add, I was particularly interested in uh, derivatives and the transparency in terms of hedging their investments, which was an issue that I raised earlier. Well, that is clearly also part of good risk management and disclosure on how this is being done. Because it's clear that if you want to guarantee something in the long term, you cannot possibly do that without using derivatives. So you have to do that. And I want to know whether my pension fund is doing that and whether it is not speculating but actually doing something in the interest of the members. That's important. More questions? Yes, please. Questions, not statements. Huh? No, no. And I'll be, uh, more, I'll I, be stricter, I'll, I'll be stricter asking, than Marian. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> I'm asking myself uh, why we are focusing exclusively on the second pillar and why we are not discussing about uh, the so-called first pillar Bs, in, and I'm thinking here systems in Eastern Europe, or, but also in other countries, because they are, they are behaving just like uh, second pillar pension funds. Who, who feels like answering this question? <laughs> no problem. No, no. Okay. okay. Thank you. Fritz, yeah. So can I just ask, do you mean mandatory private pensions, such as in new member states? No, I'm thinking of the other regulation, which uh, I, when I'm looking at the pension system in Poland, for example, or in other eastern, they are, they are, not, they are not funded, they are, not fu they are partly, at least partly funded. So if you have funds and you have to invest those funds, Normally, you, have, you will have this very the same risk as in a normal second pillar uh, pension fund. Now, I, I think that you, you raise a very important question. It is not always clear what is first and what is second pillar. Some people talk about pillar 1A or pillar 1B. And I don't care. You know, what we need to know is the substance of what we are doing. And it is a fact that um, the newer member states were not associated with the negotiation of the pension funds directive. So they, they, they have developed pension fund regimes which are not necessarily covered. What we have tried to do is to ensure that all, also all the new member states at least create a possibility to create occupational pension funds. Some of them did not want to do that. So we have forced them to at least allow that. But it is one of the issues that we raised in the Green Paper about the scope of the Pension Funds Directive. Should we expand the scope of the Pension Funds Directive to cover other structures which call themselves pension funds, but are not clear whether they are occupational or not occupational? So that's what, something we are looking at. Do I have more questions? Yes, please. Colleague, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, ex-colleague. 
Uh, Ike van den Burg, uh, I, I used to be a member of, uh, of this parliament and I'm now working uh, uh, particularly also in self-regulatory uh, uh, issues. So uh, my question would be uh, what kind of roles uh, do you see for self-regulation uh, in this um, field of uh, both the, the pension uh, protection and um, protection of, of beneficiaries, uh, but also in um, in risk uh, management, corporate governance, uh, and that type of uh, things. Because the commissioner was uh, saying something about also ideas uh, about self-regulation. Uh, and another issue, if you allow me, uh, which I would like to, to raise, is um, um, have we are now speaking a lot about the, the guarantees and the security uh, that has to be uh, provided in via solvency or via other uh, methods. Uh, another interest of people is uh, the, uh, the investments that uh, pension funds and long-term investors uh, uh, make in, uh, in the, um, also uh, our economies here in, uh, in Europe. And also that's, um, I think that's, uh, you raised the issue of the derivatives. Uh, that, that's an uh, important uh, issue, I think. Uh, to make sure that uh, long-term investors are still able uh, to invest in, uh, in, in our companies in, uh, in Europe, in our uh, infrastructure in Europe. Um, and had that, not, that this will not be killed by too many um, regulation that's uh, uh, counterproductive in that field. Self-regulation, I look at the people from the from real life, if I can call from you that. Real life, yes. From <laughs> My first reaction was here at the table, who dares to speak any more about self-regulation, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I think um, we, we are all, are, all co are convinced of the virtue of uh, smart regulation and regulation for those issues that, uh, that are relevant. Um, you mentioned uh, good uh, governance, for example. I, I think that uh, what we see uh, in practice there, that much um, many uh, countries and uh, in many instances there is a reliance on uh, self-regulation in, in good governance via the well, method of uh, good um, codes of uh, governance and, and codes of conduct which uh, can rely then on an um, explain or comply uh, principle. Uh, that should be tested um, in, in, uh, before going to uh, firm regulation on, on one or other model for governance. So I think in, in that area we, we still, uh, we, we really have to take the, the root of the codes uh, of good practice uh, for, um, even for regulation of, of the investments, uh, I don't see uh, much um, scope for uh, detailed regulation there, um, because uh, you must. Uh, we will have a new supervisory regime, I ass assume. But nevertheless, um, in, even in that regime, I think we have to stick to the prudent person rule. And uh, to disclose, of course, uh, the, the investment uh, principles, they, they, sh they will have, they are to be co disclosed already to the regulator and to the supervisor. But uh, perhaps uh, there, there should be more detail uh, given to uh, beneficiaries. Uh, also on uh, policy that you adopt as a pension fund uh, where it is in, on uh, environmental and social uh, issues. Uh, what is your attitude uh, as an pension fund? It, it, it's relevant for the people to know about that. Ihre Antwort. Ich denke, Solvency 2 hat ja drei Säulen. Einmal Transparenz. I think if we're talking about the three pillars, we want transparency. We must give full information to our members what their rights are, whether the uh, pension plan is properly financed, and uh, also we have to talk about solvency in the second pillar, and also risk management in solvency too. All pension funds in Germany must meet these criteria. 
it doesn't mean that solvency one is still valid. That's only a quality standard. But for risk management, there is self-regulation. The pension funds and other institutions must, on a daily basis, verify, check what the risk situation is and see whether any adjustments need to be made or So, so these are very strict requirements, but there is, a, at the same time, self-regulation when it comes to making risk capital available. We have quantitative uh, restrictions, solvency two, investments in shares or in corporates have to be reviewed downwards. We have to stress tests which are compulsory. And we have to be very clear about that. There is also de-risking. And this means that there is a different uh, investment behavior required and we have to know this. We think that these rules will not be valid in the long term. Just, just briefly uh, to respond to, to Iga's question also, um, it's wrong to say that Solvency II will no longer make it possible for pension funds to be long-term investors in the economy. That is completely wrong. But it is, of course, true, as Schwind has, has just said, that if you have a risk-based solvency regime, you have to take account of the risks. And some people come to me and say, I want to invest in the capital market, but I don't want to consider the risks involved in that. That's not the right message. I think we should be able to invest in the capital market and calculate the risk of such an investment. What we should be doing, and that's something we need to think about when developing the new rules, is what kind of confidence levels do we set? How is the calibration calculated? And there, this is not something that actuaries say there is only one number, there are many numbers. And let's find the right number. I have two questions uh, left. Marquis de Bloch, who is a colleague from the Belgian Parliament, and the gentleman in the back. Marquis, you're first. Thank you. Uh, as a member of the Social Affairs uh, Committee, I, I wanted to ask to this uh, panel, because the first uh, panel uh, talked about it, what will you do for people who have only the first pillar in the future to live from? Uh, I mean, last year was the year against uh, poverty. I mean, this should be a subject to... Who wants to tackle this? Yes. I have oh, everybody. Okay, but short answers, please. I think I could just reiterate what the Commissioner said. That there's no solution if you don't look at the three issues that are key together, adequate sustainability and safety. Safety is the technical issue we're discussing here. Uh, but of course, there will be no pensions if they're not sustainable. They cannot be sustainable without having some adequacy. Uh, we cannot reduce poverty in Europe. Uh, by 20 million without a major help from pension systems. Uh, poverty levels for older people are higher than for other age groups. Without our pension systems, many more people would be poor. Thank you. Well, I think, to be honest, one has to say that security and sustainability are very important. But of course, the first thing is to make sure that the money is there to cover. And the stakeholders are having to pay for this. That's the workers and the employers. And we have to see in Germany, for example, what we've done. And it's similar to in the Netherlands. We've got the two sides of the companies and the state pension, but where you've got collective bargaining 
for the arrangements, it means that you have all the involved people around the same table sorting it out. Um, that was uh, just what I was saying at the end of my presentation, that we should bear in mind that 60% uh, of the people don't have a second pillar. So what is then the action to do that is to promote the second pillar and to do everything possible to, to develop it and so that everybody, every citizen, every working person has a second pillar. And for that, of course, uh, I think the, 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 the major solution uh, we should propose is to have um, agreements between uh, employers and uh, employees or, or unions, if you want, uh, to, to install those schemes in, in, in all the companies uh, because there is no other route. Uh, otherwise, you must take uh, the compulsory route in, in, in another way. Uh, and, and we are more uh, in favor of uh, negotiated uh, solutions. Monsieur Lourdel, une remarque brève. Just a brief comment. Thank you, Chairman. I'd, thank, I'd like to thank the Member of Parliament who raised this uh, question because I was focusing actually on the second pillar in the uh, statement, but it's very important as well that the first pillar be shored up because that's the universal base. And that's the one which is going to make sure that everybody gets a certain amount of pension. So it's incredibly important. I didn't dwell on that at all, but it's a crucial aspect, really essential. And you have to be able to guarantee financing under this first uh, pillar. But that, of course, is the question of taxation, uh, fiscal matters, contributions, and all that sort of thing for another time, another debate. But in any case, I think the member's question was very relevant, and that point needs to be made very clearly. Thank you. The last two uh, together. You first. Sorry, I, no, 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 no. It's the gentleman behind you. I'm sorry, you're, you're, I have to be strict, because otherwise I'm, I'm very strict on timing, and I think we have to be. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Xavier Collier from the French Insurance Association. I wanted to come back to the IORP directive because it uh, has been said exp implicitly that it creates the European passport for di different providers of pensions. And uh, in this view, it is related to the internal market development. Of course, everyone agrees that social and labor law are national rules. Uh, on the contrary, the solvency rules are European-based, mainly, but solvency, too, is at this stage uh, leaving many div divergences between different countries, different rules. And so, for example, you have technical provisions which are calculated with very different rules, different hypotheses in different countries. And so my question was, um, is the review of the IOP directive dealing with these kind of divergences uh, in order to have a, a more uh, developed internal market? I suppose the answer is yes, but I wanted to have the confirmation by Karel. Th thank you, Bernard Elbeck from uh, FAMA. I would like to hear the views of uh, the member of the panel on uh, the measure that could be taken or should be taken in the white paper to enhance the portability uh, of pension uh, across Europe. And I'd like to see whether you would agree that the most uh, promising route uh, in the short term would be to promote the uh, mobility portability of uh, a DC pension scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Is the answer yes to the first question? Yes, the answer is yes. I think it's very important that when we say that pension liability should be fully funded, that we know what that means. I think one of the problems of the past has been that we promise a lot of things without putting a number to what we have promised. And portability. Who is going to answer the question on portability? Yeah. I have no answer to the specific question. This is for commissioners and the college to decide how we'll move on that. Uh, of course, it's much easier to move on DC. You're, you're right. The complication is with DB. So I think you, you made that analysis right. Uh, then, very briefly, to the Belgian parliamentarian. Uh, the good news about uh, poverty protection is that minimum pensions have improved in most member states in the last 10 years. 
women are better covered. Uh, it's also the good news is that if we only paid minimum pensions, the, this would be quite affordable. So poverty protection is also affordable given the demographics. The real challenge is in earnings-related pensions. Thank you. Marion. I just want to make a comment to my Belgian colleague here because I do think that's a very important question. And just to let you know what the Parliament said in, in its report, it talked about that first pillar pensions. It called on member states to ensure that they were above the, the poverty line. But I do think, my final comment on that is, I do think that if that is to be the case, that it you know, introduces the question that we discussed earlier with the Commissioner about pension liabilities being part of the Stability and Growth Pact and part of public debt and debt liabilities. And I do think his answer at the end of it was that it was an open question. And I would like to have questioned him further on that to see where, in fact, the issue of, of pension liabilities for member states, where it lies in all of that. But I do think that's an important question as well. Thank you very much, Marion. Uh, I would like to conclude now. I know there are many questions left. Um, it would be difficult to, in three hours, solve or discuss all the problems. So thank you very much on behalf of our group leader uh, and both of us uh, to be here and to, to share the floor with us. Uh, I must say that I go out a little more frightened than I came in, uh, especially if I may take one piece of paper out of the whole thing, is your graphic on uh, the debts of, of the public debts in the in the European countries, where if we don't do anything in the in the uh, euro area by 2060, and I know it's a, it's very far away, it's 422.3 percent. How do you know it? The 0.3 I, I, it intrigues me a bit, but <laughs> in 2060, um, but it's scary. And in 2030, we're at 140. And that's uh, very strange. And the differences between member states, I don't know how you calculate all this, but I think we should start doing things. Because if, the, if these lines are right, uh, I'm even more scary now than when I said, said something just a minute ago. Thank you very much for being here, sharing uh, thoughts with us. And there's drinks outside. So if you, maybe we can drown, drown our sorrow a little bit. Thank you very much.